So, having looked at British, French and German tanks of World War I that I would like to see added to War Thunder, it is now time to take a look at the American tanks of World War I. So, it's quite easy to imagine that based on their performance in World War II, America must have been a major tank user during World War I. But in actuality, very few of their tanks ever went into full-scale production, and none of them ever actually managed to see combat during World War I. Because of course America got involved in the war much later than the other major powers and started designing tanks a lot later than other powers. Though French and German tanks did often use American technology like the American Holt tractor chassis for their designs. So America did still provide massive contributions to tank development in other ways. So I'm going to skip some of the early attempts like the Victoria slash Hamilton tank and the CLB-75 track layer. As while well, these are very interesting designs, especially the CLB-75, which I think is one of the most unusual looking World War I tanks I've ever seen. But these were basic designs that were usually fitted with unarmoured metal and usually weren't even armed. Though I might cover these vehicles in another video, but they wouldn't be suitable to be added to War Thunder. For the first actual tank I would like to see added to War Thunder, we will start with the Holt Gas Electric Tank. One of the first serious American designs, and one that would be pretty effective in-game. Being armed with a front-mounted Vickers 75mm mounting gun, which admittedly does have a short barrel with a low muzzle velocity, but this would still be effective, especially if firing HE shells, as armour for most World War I tanks rarely exceeded 15mm, so the HE shell should be especially effective against enemy tanks while two 30 caliber Browning machine guns were mounted in sponsons on each of the flanks on each side of the tank, and these could also pose a threat to enemies when firing AP rounds. Of course being mounted in the nose of the tank might cause some issues, but the Hulk Gas Electric tank is fitted with a 90 horsepower petrol engine, which in a rather unusual design feature supplies power to a generator that in turn powers two electric motors, one for each track. So this does increase the complexity of the vehicle but allows for much quicker turning, which is especially useful when turning to engage enemies, and also gives a top speed of just under 6 miles per hour or 10 kilometers an hour, which is a pretty decent speed for this period of time. The armor maxes out at around 15 millimeters, which again isn't unusual for World War I tanks, though the side and rear armor will likely be thinner and thus more vulnerable to enemy fire and possibly even machine gun fire while the crew required to man the vehicle is six, presumably two for the main gun, two for each machine gun, and a driver and commander, which gives pretty good redundancy in the event of crew losses. In real life, the Holt gas electric tank didn't progress beyond a prototype, perhaps due to the complexity of the steering system, or maybe because it was ill-suited to crossing trenches, but regardless of the reasons why, only one was built. In War Thunder though, I would suggest adding it at around battle rating 0.3, maybe 0.7, depending on how well it performs, as it does have a very good armament and the ability to turn quickly, while the armour and six-man crew do make it a tough tank to take down, though of course if flanked or detracked, it will be a sitting target for any enemies to deal with at their leisure. Moving on, we now come to the Steam Tank Tracked which was designed in collaboration between the US Army Corps of Engineers and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And like the name suggests, it was powered by two steam engines, developing a total of 500 horsepower and giving it a top speed of around 4 miles per hour or 6.4 kilometers an hour, so a little bit slower than the previous tank. Now it might seem odd to use steam engines, but bear in mind steam engines had been around for a very long time and they were a very well understood and developed technology whereas petrol and diesel engines were fairly new and still hadn't reached their full potential that you would see in future engine designs. So it's not completely outlandish that there would at least be a design tested with steam engines. The other reason for using steam engines is that they were used to, quote, atomize and propel a stream of fuel oil for about 90 yards, end quote. The flamethrower is also the main armament and might not be too useful against enemy tanks, though I believe in game flamethrowers do have a small amount of penetration, and with early tanks having thin armour and sometimes even gaps in their armour, the flamethrower might actually have some use here. While its secondary armament of 2 to 4 30 caliber machine guns would also pose a threat to lightly armoured vehicles, while its own armour maxes out at 12.7mm and it would have required a crew of 8 to man this vehicle. I could see this being added at 0.0 or maybe 0.3 depending on how powerful the flamethrower is, 
and it would be interesting to see a steam powered land vehicle in game, especially if the steam engines had their own unique sound effects. In real life the steam tank tract was sent to France in September 1918 to be demonstrated in front of General Pershing, commander of US forces, but it was not accepted for service and would not see combat. However it at least made it to France, which is more than can be said for the alternative steam powered design, the steam tank wheeled, alternatively named steam wheel tank, which is a rather odd design for which there is not much information and what information it is is often contradictory. So as you can see this is a rather odd looking tank, with two large wheels and one smaller wheel, and there is some debate on whether this is the front or rear of the vehicle. I believe the consensus nowadays is that the two big wheels are at the front of the vehicle and the smaller wheel is at the rear and used for steering, which makes sense as the small wheel would very quickly get caught up on most obstacles which would result in the vehicle getting stuck. The armament also has contradictory information, with some sources stating it was to use a single 75mm Vickers mountain howitzer gun, an example of which you can see in front of the tank here, while two 30 caliber machine guns would make up the secondary armament. However there are also sources stating that two 6 pounder guns were used in place of the howitzer, which is more in line with how the British tanks were equipped, though I'm not entirely convinced if this was not just a hypothetical armament if it was to go into full production. Meanwhile the armour was to max out at around 19mm, while two 75 horsepower double steam engines were to drive the tank to a maximum speed of 5 miles per hour or 8 km an hour, while the crew complement is 6. I'll be honest, I could understand Gaijin not adding this vehicle, or at least not until further research is done to confirm its stats, but if added I could see this being a 0.3 to 0.7 tank, as it has a pretty good armament and decent armour for the day, and assuming the two large wheels are the front of the vehicle, it should do decently enough at crossing obstacles, though if the small wheel is at the front I could see this struggling quite a bit. Overall the wheeled design was not that good, with the prototype being a one-off example, and it was scrapped sometime after 1924. Lastly for the prototype designs we have the skeleton tank, which was a rather unique way of trying to save on weight while retaining the trench crossing capabilities of heavier tanks, having a length of 7.6 meters compared to the 8 meters of the British Mark V heavy tank which would allow it to cross enemy trenches, at a time when other light tanks of the day would have struggled with this. It also saves some weight by essentially applying the all or nothing armour scheme from battleships to the tank design, with only the central fighting compartment being armoured, leaving huge gaps around the rest of the tank, which might allow some shells to pass through them harmlessly, but to my view makes a disabling hit on the tracks or support beams much more likely. Unfortunately it is only armed with a single 30 caliber machine gun in a turret, which would by default make it a 0.0, .0 tank in game due to its limited effectiveness against other tanks. Armour max is out at around 12mm, which is decent enough for a light tank, though only the turret is rounded with the main crew compartment being completely flat sided, which does of course limit the effectiveness of the armour. Mobility is okay at around 5 miles per hour or 8 km an hour, while the crew complement is only two, a driver and a gunner, which in game is a disadvantage as a single penetrating hit will likely knock out the crew or seriously injure them, which severely impacts their effectiveness. As mentioned this would have to be a 0.0, .0 tank due to its armament, but it could be a fun tank to play and it is a pretty unique looking tank, and I think it would be a fun tank to see in game. Again like the other prototypes, only one was built, but this time the prototype wasn't scrapped and it exists to this day. So as we can see America was testing all sorts of weird and wonderful designs, but there were some designs that actually were made in decent numbers, with the first of these being the M1918 Ford 3 ton tank, officially a light tank but this could also be seen as the first of the tankettes, and 15,000 of these tanks were ordered with the design being cheap to produce, having 12mm of armour, a two man crew and a top speed of 8 miles per hour or 12.8 km an hour. Unfortunately it is again only armed with a 30 caliber Browning machine gun, again making this a 0.0, .0 tank, especially since its armament is only forward facing, though due to its small height of only 1.6 meters, it could make a good ambush tank. Despite the order of 15,000, only 15 would be built 
due to the end of the war, and the fact that a new and better design was available, the M1917 light tank. Now your first thought might be that this looks identical to the French Renault FT17, and the reason for that is it's basically a copy of the Renault FT17, with some changes to fit American requirements. For example, using a Buda 42 horsepower four cylinder engine, which gives the same top speed of 5 miles per hour or 8 kilometers an hour, but produces more torque, which makes it better for crossing shell strewn terrain or other obstacles. The turret was of a polygonal design, which was also used by the French, but the French also used other designs like circular turrets. Like the French FT-17s, armament was either a short 37mm or a machine gun, but in this case it was a 30 calibre M1917 Marlin or M1919 Brownie machine gun instead of the French Hotchkiss. There were also other minor changes, including the exhaust muffler being positioned on the left side of the tank instead of the right, solid steel idler wheels instead of wooden ones, and slight differences to the frontal armour, which still maxes out at around 20 to 22 mm as well as other minor changes, or the crew complement remains at two, with a driver and gunner. There was also a prototype fitted with a Franklin 100 horsepower engine, which gave a top speed of 9 miles per hour or 14.5 kilometers an hour, and used a 30 caliber M1919 Browning machine gun in an octagonal turret and had its chassis lengthened by 30 centimeters. But only seven tanks were converted to this type, which was named the M1917A1. For the variants with the machine guns, these should be added at 0.0, .0 while the variants with the 37mm guns would go at 0.3, as the 37mm gun is the same one as used on existing tanks already in-game and would not have access to the APCR round as in-game, while the use of a two-man crew would make the tank vulnerable in-game. But I think it would still work pretty well, if only due to having a turret unlike so many tanks of this era, giving it a huge edge over its enemies. In real life, this wouldn't enter service in time to see combat in World War I, though 952 would eventually be completed after the war. But the M1917 would see action during various riots, the attack on the Bonus Army in 1934, and many would eventually be sold to Canada for scrap value during 1940, so that they could be used to train tank crews during World War II. Of course, the US Army also required a heavy tank, and here we get to revisit the Mark VIII also known as the Liberty or International Tank, which we previously covered in the episode looking at British tanks. Basically, this was a joint design between Britain and the United States, which was to equip all of the Allied armies, with Britain providing the armament and armour, and America providing the mechanical components, which would all be shipped to a factory in France, which would then produce them. However, despite this, in American service there would be some minor differences to the British version, for example, the engine used was now a Liberty 300 horsepower V12 aero engine, giving a top speed of around 5.2 miles per hour or 8.3 kilometers an hour, which is decent enough for a heavy tank weighing 40 tons. The armament was to be two 57mm six pounder guns mounted inside sponsons on each side of the tank, and up to seven 30 caliber machine guns. Though some sources state that this was later reduced to just five, but these could be placed in the sponsons on each side of the tank and five could be placed in the upper works, with a deflector plate allowing the rear gunner to hit targets within the blind spots towards the rear of the tank. Meanwhile, the armour was a maximum of 16mm, and the crew complement was about eight, consisting of a driver, commander, four men for the two main guns, and the rest to man the machine guns. So much like the British version, I would suggest a better rating of about 0.7, as it has two excellent guns, a large crew, and a decent if not spectacular speed, while also able to engage enemies in all directions with its machine guns. In real life, the Mark VIII would arrive too late to take part in World War I, though America would still assemble a hundred of these tanks using the various already produced kits, with these serving until the 1930s, by which point they were pretty worn out, with all but two of them eventually being scrapped. So as you can see, America has plenty of tanks to choose from in-game, but in real life, they didn't have any domestically produced tanks to actually use on the battlefield, or not actually delivered on time to see service on the battlefield. So they had to rely on using French and British produced tanks, namely 214 French Renault FT-17s and the British Mark Vs, 
with 213 of the FT-17s and 28 32 Mark V's shipped back to the United States after the war. Oddly enough, the Mark V's were supposedly seen as the best of the tanks in service with the US Army in the aftermath of World War I, with the Mark VIII seen as too large and cumbersome in the aftermath of trench warfare, and the FT-17s and M1917 were seen as too small and mechanically unreliable. Though due to being available in large numbers, the light tanks would remain the mainstay of American tank forces for much of the interwar period. So that's it for American tanks of World War I that I would like to see added to War Thunder, and I'd be interested to hear your views on these tanks and any others you would like me to cover. I look forward to reading your comments below. So I hope you've enjoyed the episode, hopefully you'll join me for the next one. I've been Toretto and I'll see you next time.